All right, everybody. So I think we can start getting going. Um, I see we have about 40 participants who have now joined us. So welcome to the participants and to the panel. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Sean Flynn. I'm the director of the program on information, justice, and intellectual property at American University, Washington College of Law. And I'm also the co-chair of the IP committee of the American branch of the International Law Association. And my co-chair is showing up as Sean Flynn. That's Peter Yu over there. <laughs> I must have given you my link. Uh, but so on behalf of uh, my co-chair, Peter Yu and myself, I wanna welcome you to our annual panel on international intellectual property issues. And given the situation at the time, we organized this one around um, international intellectual property and COVID, how um, inter international intellectual property and international institutions are changing, adapting, contributing to, forming a barrier to some of the solutions to the problems that COVID has been posing. So both on the treatment side, but also in the many other areas. So copyright and the rights to research. Um, businesses that are engaged in the high technology space that may be facing various kinds of problems resulting from COVID, but that, that intersect with the system. And then, and then solutions, including both traditional kind of international treaty preparation, exceptions, et cetera, but also voluntary measures and institutional changes that are, that are all undergoing at this time. So it's actually a highly evolving field um, at this very moment. And so just, we're very privileged to have an amazing panel um, of, of experts who are engaged in projects in this area right now to uh, discuss a little bit about what's going on in this area and some of the challenges they see. So just by way of quick um, introductions, and then I'm going to take us straight into um, a roundtable discussion and just ask each of our panelists some questions and um, start us off and try to you know keep it kind of organic and flowing if you have questions yourself from the audience um, you can use the chat function or the q a function in zoom i think both of those i should be able to see but my understanding is the chat is open so as you know myself as the moderator i'll be watching the chat and um, try to pick up any questions there but it's a fairly short session i think we have 50 minutes um, and i will put in the chat a uh, room uh, a, a Zoom lounge that some of us will be in afterwards. So if you don't get to ask your question or meet some of the panelists here, you can you can meet us there. So um, we're joined by uh, first Rashmi Banga, who is a senior economist at, at UNCTAD at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And UNCTAD just put out um, a very interesting report calling for a moratorium on certain international intellectual property provisions to facilitate COVID treatment. So she'll tell us a little bit about um, that report. And also it, immediately there's already been a proposal in the World Trade Organization to do just what UNCTAD called for. So she might be able to update us a little um, on that. I hope we'll be joined by James Love who, who came to our, our pre-meeting and I'm hoping uh, to be able to rope him back in, but he's um, the executive director at Knowledge Ecology International and is an active contributor to the debates of the World Health Organization about how to create institutional responses, both on the um, pooling patent rights and also on funding mechanisms to ensure um, the globalization, the fair and equitable globalization of treatment and vaccine options. Um, Alain Roca de Sousa, who's a, a professor of uh, civil and intellectual property at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, who's actively engaged at the World Intellectual Property Organization including around exceptions for researchers, which is now taking kind of a center stage for text and data mining researchers and other researchers that wanna to contribute to solving um, COVID type problems today. And then um, George Contreras, a professor of law at the University of Utah and a fellow at Pidgeot. Um, and he's the co-founder of the Open COVID Pledge, which has become a very um, popular, uh, highly used mechanism for rights holders to voluntarily share their intellectual property rights. And you could talk both about that mechanism and some of the things that are going on in the international field to post a little bit could go on um, to contribute to it. And then um, Marcia Simone 
uh, Cadigan, who is a uh, intellectual property and technology lawyer. She used to be very involved in the international system doing trade policy and such, and now advises private clients. And so it is able to kind of give us a nexus for how businesses and you know, potential clients of lawyers and things like that are actually dealing today. And then finally, my co-chair, uh, Peter Yu, who um, will back clean up with us a little bit and help us retie everything back to the international treaties field. field. Um, Peter Yu is, a, is an expert in international intellectual property laws and written extensively on that, on that subject. So I'll, I'll, I'll take people um, generally in that order, although I'll probably skip James if he doesn't show up. But um, starting with, with Rashmi, if you would you know, answer kind of the question I posed to you, but tell us a little bit about UNCTAD's um, position and then what's been happening in the WTO around um, should we be suspending trade rules that, that um, regulate intellectual property either to facilitate treatments for other matters. So Rashmi, thank you for joining us. It's nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really happy to join this panel and uh, very good afternoon to all the participants. Uh, last month, we launched our trade and development report and uh, as expected, uh, our estimates are very worrisome. The global growth is going to uh, you know, fall by 4%, 4.3%. And uh, what our estimates show is that the recovery is not going to be a V-shaped recovery, but it's going to be a K-shaped recovery with a V-shaped recovery for the wealthy. Uh, and a struggle for the rest. And what we also find is that the global south will be economically harder hit and will take more time to recover also because of the, uh, the measures that have been put in place, the rescue measures, uh, uh, you know, they, they are on an average 30% of GDP in the developed countries, but they do not even reach 5% of the GDP of developing countries. So given this, um, uh, you know, the, the developing countries are going to face a lot of challenges the governments will need to do a lot more, give additional support to their SMEs, to the sectors which have been really affected. But as we all know that the policy space available to the governments are very is very limited because of the trade and investment treaties and trade agreements. So uh, what the trade and development report uh, is really calling for is kind of a, you know, a, a peace clause in the WTO as well as in the FTAs and uh, bilateral investment treaties, uh, specifically uh, in relation to all the pandemic related activities of the government or actions of the government. And uh, it also calls for a, a you know, immediate uh, moratorium on the ISDS cases, because we know a lot of multinational corporations are already preparing uh, you know, legal cases against the governments because of the actions the governments have taken. Uh, given this scenario, it is, you, as we all appreciate, it is very important for the governments to, uh, to take action with respect to uh, prevention, containment, as well as treatment of COVID-19. And what COVID-19 has actually done is it has exposed the inter interconnectedness of the world economy. We know that uh, nobody will be cured unless everybody is cured. And uh, it is very important that once the vaccine and uh, other uh, related procedures are developed, uh, the, the, this, the, the manufacturers all around the world are quickly able to do it because what we really need is affordable, timely access to medicines and also to other medical products. So in this uh, respect, uh, the Trade and Development Report has uh, you know, put forward a call uh, and it has also uh, uh, said that it is very important to recover better and also to address the inherent inequalities that existed in the hyper-globalized world even before the pandemic hit. And for that uh, reason, uh, for recovering better, it is important for all of us for, uh, to have a globally integrated solution. And this solution can uh, be implemented only if there is policy space available to the governments and they can take uh, actions without uh, really uh, being restricted by information or data or IP restrictions. So in this context, uh, I will not take the, we will not take the credit of this uh, proposal, but in this context, uh, uh, a proposal is, has been put forward by South Africa and India in the WTO uh, with respect to a waiver, which is called a TRIPS waiver, because we have a TRIPS agreement in the WTO, which is uh, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property. 
So the proposal calls for a, a waiver, a TRIPS waiver, which is a temporary waiver with respect to certain provisions of the TRIPS agreement. Not all provisions, but just certain provisions which are in section one, four, five, and seven of part two of the TRIPS agreement, which uh, uh, relates to the patents, industrial designs, copyright, and protection of undisclosed information, which is the trade secrets. So what is believed that these four provisions uh, if a waiver is given uh, to the governments, then this will help the governments to quickly have access to timely and affordable uh, medicines as well as medical products, because it is not just the vaccine which is important, it is also the ventilators, the mask and all the uh, related artificial intelligence which might be uh, needed later for the treatment of COVID and containment of COVID. Uh, and there is, uh, you know, it can be argued that already there are some flexibilities within the TRIPS but these flexibilities are mainly with respect to the patents and also the developing countries lag the, the capacities, you know, in terms of technical and legal capacities uh, to, uh, to put in, to uh, take advantage of these flexibilities. I think in the Q&A, we can uh, talk more about, uh, uh, you know, uh, why this waiver is needed, uh, even if there are some flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement. Let me just uh, quickly brief you on the status of this uh, proposal. This was uh, put forward uh, uh, on 2nd October and on 16th October this month, there was a discussion in WTO TRIPS Council. Uh, a lot of developing countries supported the proposal. There were more than 30 developing countries which supported the proposal, but the proposal was uh, blocked by eight uh, developed countries, including Brazil, EU, Japan, Norway, US and UK, which opposed the waiver. Uh, their argument was that there is no evidence that intellectual property rights are a genuine barrier for accessibility of COVID-19 related medicines and technologies. Uh, let me here just share with you one uh, statistics, which, which is that US, UK, EU and Japan, with just 14% of global population have access to over 50% of expected COVID-19 vaccine supplies through the end of 2021. Already five plus billion doses have been purchased by these countries through advanced purchase agreements and options. So there is, uh, as our report has also uh, highlighted and concluded that there is a need for a coordinated global strategy to overcome the unprecedented public health situation and countries will need policy space to implement the related measures in order to protect the citizens. So I'll stop here, but uh, I really look forward to discussions on this. Uh, Thank you. That's terrific. Thank, thank you, Rashmi. And, and maybe just because I know there's a lot of, you know, students in the audience and people who, who may just be, you know, coming to this issue for the first time, almost to just kind of repeat some of the things that I heard Rashmi saying. But, you know, in the context of treatments, you, you already see wealthy countries having pre-purchased a lot of the vaccines that are going to roll out. And so the question becomes, how, how are countries that haven't been part of that pre-purchase process, how are they going to find, make, um, be able to purchase vaccines and treatments for their own people in the context of globalized patent rights that are, that are enforced in you know, every country now? And one of the solutions that was used during the AIDS crisis was for, was for different countries to issue so-called compulsory licenses. So forcing a company to license other perhaps local or you know from other countries production but in order to do that today you would need to either follow the provisions that are in the WTO's IP agreement trips um, or in this case and so the proposal is just waive those agreements and basically let let countries just kind of um, not have to worry about the international law in that field um, Jamie, I mean, you've you've been very involved in both sides of this. Do you want to add to anything I just say before moving to some of the other things that are going on? Like, do you want to fill in any more context there? You're muted still. Sorry. In terms of COVID, if you're trying to do things fast, the the, um, the voluntary license is something that has a lot of advantages in the sense that. There's quite a few countries that have never granted a compulsory license. In some cases, they don't have any legal procedures in place to do that. I've, we worked in compulsory license in a lot of countries, and sometimes the first license is, is quite a challenge for a lot of countries. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, also some of the um, uh, there's some territorial limits typically in a compulsory license or often uh, the case depending on, on the mechanism you use and uh, so so many countries such a big market so I I think the compulsory license can drive people into favorable voluntary licensing. And I think that's, we could have seen, but there are other points of pressure, I think on the vaccine manufacturers other than the compulsory license or the therapeutics manufacturers, uh, including the fact that governments have funded quite a bit of the research and development right off the bat. And uh, s since the role of the government in funding the research and development, in some cases paying to build factories uh, is so extensive, as well as being the primary purchaser of everything. I think governments have lots of leverage that they don't have necessarily to the same degree in other areas of disease. And what are some of the other other um, tools that are being discussed now? You can relate them back to you know some of the previous um, institutions that were erected under AIDS, if you want to want to. But so uh, Covax is a, is something that. I don't even know what that stands for, <laughs> but there's various, um, you know, um, voluntary measures to pool either income on one side or patent rights on another as, as different ways to get over the problem. What are, what, are, what are some of those being discussed now? Well, one thing that we find helpful is to, is to separate the issue of the products, which are the subject of COVAX, for example, which is this facility to do some um, uh, work in the procurement side, managed through Gavi, an institution that uh, the Gates Foundation is, plays a big role, but also governments do in uh, in, in dealing with uh, making sure that some products are available for developing countries. Because right now, as you mentioned earlier, it's a very it's a very unequal distribution of who's going to get vaccines, for example, first at this point. Uh, but there's a separate issue we think on know-how and patents, not just patents, but also know-how and access to, to cell lines. We think that it's inevitable you're going to have nationalism and inequality of access to products in the beginning. There's not enough capacity. It's a huge market. Uh, the companies that are involved in this do not have the scale where they can actually themselves reach everything. And that's not a good situation. And that's things that, things that the, 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 the various access pillars in the WHO, the World Health Organization, are dealing with. But we think that the know-how and the, and the patent rights, they should not be hoarded in the same way products are. Countries are hoarding products like they were hoarding uh, masks and uh, uh, N95 masks and other things before. Uh, but there should be no hoarding of the know-how. I know that uh, there were some news reports where people were complaining about the Chinese or the Russians trying to steal vaccine technology. And our, our attitude was that nobody should have to steal anything when it comes to technology as to how to make a, uh, a vaccine for, uh, uh, for, for COVID. I think even the Financial Times would agree with this. The Financial Times early on wrote an editorial saying that they should use compulsory license to make sure that uh, uh, there are basically no barriers for people making uh, drugs and vaccines for the, for the pandemic because the Financial Times knew that the whole world was suffering, not just people that had COVID, but people that uh, were affected economically, for example. And it was a massive global uh, uh, crisis for the whole world. And they thought that uh, speed was important. So on the manufacturing side, we'd hoped that everything would have been open source from the beginning, not just the patents, which I think is the easiest thing to do in terms of the things. It's not that easy, but it's easier than making sure that the know-how is opened up as well. And that's something that's uh, uh, as, is more challenging. But uh, the vehicle that was supposed to do that globally was the COVID technology access pool by the World Health Organization. Uh, the, the formal proposal was initially made by the president of Costa Rica, and then it was endorsed by a, a large number of NGOs and, and public health activists in some countries, but not all countries. Uh, but the implementation has been almost stillborn within the WHO. There's been almost no implementation of the pool. And I think that you can trace that to opposition to the pooling and open sourcing of the know-how and the technology, as well as the patents from institutions like the Gates Foundation, the German government, other uh, major funders, and uh, a, a, a combination of actual signaling by those institutions to the WHO that they don't want that to happen, 
and some self-censorship within the WHO, which is very afraid about how to fund the organization, given the, um, uh, for example, among other things, the US cutting off its funding to the WHO. So we're really behind the curve on CTAP but I think that uh, you know we have people haven't really given up on this, although they're discouraged. But uh, uh, what 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 really I think is necessary to make it happen is not just to talk to the companies, but to talk to people funding the research and development. The U.S., Europeans, other government gov countries around the world, even in in, uh, in 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 China or Russia or different places, are writing very big checks. The U.S. some some checks are over a billion dollars at a crack in terms of the vaccine uh, subsidies. It's, I've never seen anything like it in my life before. And so the, the issue is to get some, some, some connection between the money and the openness of the know-how. Now, one hope you might have is Biden's coming in. He said if, if they have a vaccine, they'll share it with the world. And he hasn't given any details as to how that would play itself out. But if the US was to flip on this issue, I think other countries would flip too. So Jamie, around the time of the CETA proposal, uh, KEI and a lot of NGOs have been encouraging uh, some of the WTO members who have opted out of the Article 31 bis mechanism to opt back in. Can you say something about that? Well, yeah, I think that the, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's some, some controversy about this. I think that all the people I work with are supportive of the proposal by South Africa and India to waive WTO rules, not only for patents, but on data, on uh, copyright outside of performance rights, uh, uh, really uh, mo most of the important sections of the TRIPS agreement, they wouldn't waive for things related to the pandemic during the pandemic. So it's a very broad proposal uh, that, that they've made. One of the concerns that, that, that I, I would have sort of had at the beginning was that we think countries already have lots of tools to deal with patents uh, particularly in an emergency, not only an emergency, but this is, you know, in the old days, they used to say, well, you can only use a compulsory licensing if it's a, if it's a national emergency, right? And that used to be the way they try and get out of using it for like uh, AIDS drugs or, 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 or cancer drugs or things like that. They try and say, well, it's not a, it's, it's, that's not an emergency. Well, this is an emergency, sorry. So this one really qualifies by every con conceivable matter and it has the absolute best rules within the WTO for acting. So. One concern is that if you create the idea that a waiver is necessary, it may give an excuse by some countries not to use the existing to, uh, uh, authority that they already have. That said, we support the waiver, but we also don't want people to use the waiver or the lack of success in getting the waiver as an excuse not to use what's already in the national laws. George, I mean, one of the things Jamie brought up was the was the real utility and necessity of voluntary licensing measures. And you've been working on a, a very interesting project called the Open COVID Pledge. Do you wanna say a little more about that and how it might intersect with the international field a little? Yeah, absolutely, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, so back in late February and early March, when the scope of the pandemic was beginning to get known, there were uh, a number of news stories and reports, um, you know, some uh, proved to be exaggerated, some not, about how patents and intellectual property might present hurdles or barriers to broad dissemination of equipment, replacement parts for ventilators, respirators, um, not to mention, you know, the, the drugs and vaccines that Jamie has been talking about. Um, in response to that, some companies unilaterally uh, decided to make their patents and some design files available to others at no charge. So Medtronic and Smith's Group, um, both uh, ventilator manufacturers, uh, publicly pledged that they would make their patents available to those who wanted to use them. So. A number of us, a group of about 10 um, academics in law and science and engineering from the UK and the US got together and tried to figure out how we could help other companies do this in an easy way, right? Create a platform uh, for enabling this kind of sharing. And so we did come up with that platform and that's the Open COVID Pledge. 
which you can find at opencovidpledge.org. It is basically a simple statement about the intention to make a companies or institutions patents available for use in uh, fighting COVID-19 during the duration of the pandemic and for a year after that at no charge. There are some simple license agreements attached to this, sort of like you would have with open source code uh, software licensing. So they don't require negotiation or uh, execution. Um, they're pretty lightweight along the lines of the Creative Commons open content licenses in the copyright world. And open uh, Creative Commons is actually involved in the project and today is the steward and the host of the Open COVID Pledge. So they've been pretty instrumental in that. Um, so that was launched in early April and we fairly rapidly got quite a lot of take up, um, not from the biopharma companies, but from the rest of the companies involved in that range of activities around COVID-19 and the response that, that Rashmi talked about. So again, hospital equipment, protective gear, um, contact tracing applications, you know, resource uh, uh, management applications. Um, so companies like Microsoft, Facebook, Uber, Amazon, IBM, Intel, you know, lots of large companies in that sort of IT and computing space um, pledged their patents and some data and other, uh, other intellectual property to this effort. Uh, we also have some national laboratories, um, the Caltech uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which has um, respirator technology that they've made freely available, Sandia National Laboratory, um, which has COVID testing setups and apparatus, um, university, small companies, you know, uh, something like 30 different, <coughs> excuse me, patent holders um, have made this sort of voluntary commitment um, for something like 250,000 patents. So it's, it's a pretty sizable number. There's a parallel effort uh, that uh, has gone on in Japan uh, that a, close to 100 Japanese industrial firms have signed up to um, that covers something close to a million Japanese patents. Um, again, those are mostly um, electronics, industrial firms, some chemical companies with, you know, some pharmaceutical uh, arms. Um, but in our case, it's, it's largely been that sort of other side of the COVID response um, and not the vaccines and therapies that, uh, you know, have been the focus of, of the uh, UN type projects um, that, that Jamie and others have been talking about. So, you know, we would love for more of those uh, entities to join in, but, but I, I think the financial challenges are, are very big um, in getting those, you know, companies in that sector uh, to volunteer their patents. As Jamie said, different types of pressures might need to be applied. And what do you, so I noticed that you know the, the the participants in these voluntary measures, as you said, are largely in the tech and you know non pharmaceutical space. So, what are those other measures that that you think may need to be applied there? I mean, is it the so we talked about kind of compulsory licenses on one side. We've talked about um, some of these pooling facilities, but those are also voluntary to some to some mechanism. But what do you think the future is in this area? How how are we going to treat everybody? In the world, right? Um, it, it's a good question, and, and Jamie has a couple of questions in the chat that I'll I'll address also yeah, as sure. part of this. Um, so there have been some pledges made in the biopharma sector, right? Early on, um, Abvi pledged uh, the patents underlying its drug Coletra, which was an HIV treatment that was thought at the time potentially to have some potential efficacy for COVID-19. And then just um, a couple of weeks ago, Moderna, um, which has an mRNA uh, vaccine candidate that's in clinical trials right now, um, pledged its, its patents. And um, I actually have a blog post on Harvard's Bill of Health um, that came out yesterday about the Moderna pledge. Both Moderna and AbbVie's pledges um, the motivations behind these, of course, you know, I don't have any inside information as to their actual motivations, but looking at it 
as an outsider, there seem to be some extrinsic factors at work that might be useful. So speculation about AbbVie is that you know, AbbVie's pledge came a day after the government of Israel um, uh, imposed a compulsory license basically uh, for supply of uh, Kaletra in Israel. Um, the pledge kind of cuts off or obviates the need for further governmental action. And that's been a classic um, rationale for patent pledges you know, for years. I'll do it voluntarily so the government doesn't step in and do something even worse. Um, and is that, I mean, Jamie, would you say that's what you were kind of talking about um, as compulsory licenses become a vehicle to promote the voluntary license? Like, would, is that a success, the, what happened between Israel and Abbott? Is that, is that where we should be looking? Uh, yeah, and I think one of the reasons why the Abbey thing was uh, probably acceptable is the fact that there were generic suppliers of those products already. Uh, uh -huh. And so uh, the reason I mentioned that is for some of the COVID therapeutics and, and, and certainly for the vaccines, for a generic to enter the market, they're going to have to make bigger investments that would be the case for Kletra because that was already available from generic suppliers. So if you expect a, uh, a significant investment by the generic makers, some people have felt that the non-assert agreements may not be good enough. Now, Moderna actually addressed that in their pledge because they offered in the announcement of their pledge that they would also consider licenses to extend beyond the period of the pandemic if that was, uh, if that was, you know, if that was necessary to get more suppliers into the market. So that the Moderna pledge was, was impressive to me in that respect because it was a combination of the, of the immediate non-assert but also the possibility of licenses. The licenses are are uh, uh, potentially can be more durable than what you'd expect in some of the non-asserts, which can be in some cases in the COVID have been more or less temporary instruments. Uh, um. But the, the, the Moderna, I mean, I, this is sort of reading between the lines, Jamie, but it seems like that's a fee bearing license that Moderna is offering after the pandemic. With us. I mean, we've, uh, uh, the, the medicines patent pool has, uh, has, uh, has, has been providing most of the medicines patent pool licenses are, are royalty bearing licenses. I, I think that the, w when you go from a, a drug that costs $40,000 in the United States and $70 outside the United States, the fact that you're paying 5% of $70 as opposed to paying $40,000, I don't think you really want to complain about the 5%. And so the, uh, the, the royalty bearing per se uh, is never been, I thought, for example, Oxford, they had this big conversation about how they uh, they waived the royalties to the university during the pandemic, uh, but they went exclusive. You know, <laughs> we're like, we, well, why don't you just take like a, you know, a 3%, 5% royalty or 7%, whatever, you know, but then not go exclusive. That would have been a better outcome because you would have had more expansion, more possibility of expanded supply. So, um, and probably lower prices on the products. Uh, although the Mond Moderna contracts actually I did address the pricing issue better than, for example, some of the U.S. BARDA contracts have. Uh, so, uh, George, let me invite you to answer answer the CRISPR question in chat, if you would, and and start shifting over to some of the non-treatment options. But we'll circle back if we have enough time. But, Alon, let me let me shift over to you and and to describe, you know, what are what are some of the COVID-related copyright barriers that that are being faced now and what's going on at the World Intellectual Property Organization that might potentially be Okay, well, by. hello to everyone. And uh, the first thing is the disappointment that we have in Brazilian attitude towards the proposal that comes from India, South Africa and the mm -hmm. Brazilian. Now, what we see as an isolationist attitude towards any of the multilateral bodies. So uh, right now we see the government having this very, um, in my view, irresponsible and detached attitude, as if nothing's going to happen that they could do to improve and whatever. So it's basically washing their hands and seeing what happens. And, you know, there are very scary things going on in the country. So this, going beyond that, uh, what I've seen on the floor is that the research community itself, so there are a few issues on openness. The research uh, community itself is actually doing data and tax mining all through, all over the place. So you see a lot of different researchers and institutions actually going and actually doing data and tax mining more broadly, which is something that we do not have in our legislation at all. 
there is no uh, explicit permission to do so. Uh, but actually, most people are not even aware of data tax mining, that that actually was within the copyright framework. And uh, if there is anything good that's going to come out of this, is the awareness of the need for a data tax mining uh, exception. So far, there are people just doing it broadly. Like all. Do you want to just give us the, you know, the connection for the folks, because this is kind of a non-IP audience. What's the connection between tax and data mining on the one side, but what does copyright have to do with it? Like, which, okay. what permissions will you need? What kind of copies Mostly do you need to make? Mostly because databases are protected by copyright. So this is the key point that we see here. Databases are protected by copyright. And therefore, to extract anything from any database, you would need an authorization either by the right holder or within the law, something that allows you to do so, to do some. Um, we would need a limitation and exception for data tax mining. So, um, in order to actually, and then we've seen in two levels. One of them is we see a few initiatives against fake news on COVID and so on, and they've been using a lot of actually data and text mining, especially text uh, mining and reading to actually follow through and actually check if, to do some checking on the news, to which ones are actually, you can count on and which ones are not, are really off and fake on it. So this is one side. The second thing, on data tax mining in general that's been happening. And that happened with Zika um, um, crisis like a few years ago. Uh, a lot of the solutions came about only because of open access. So a lot of the um, journals and everything in Brazil just open access and Zika happened a few, some years ago. And that actually is what pushed for the quick result and actually the facing of Zika virus in Brazil. And they've been used, a lot of the libraries and information science people, they've been used the same technique to actually harvest uh, material that's being produced uh, to actually do the reading and so on. So that's another thing. And the third thing is actually the data itself, extracting data and getting and combining data to actually follow um, what's happening with the, with the pan pandemics and also how to get some treatment and how to face and how to actually rearrange the bed, hospital beds and so on and on and on. So yeah, what I can say is that although there's no attitude from the government itself in terms of uh, we need to move forward in opening access in all different fields, people are doing it, like researchers and institutions themselves. For the first time, uh, we've seen the higher education institutions and right now we have at least three of them have passed through an internal regulation, regulating copyright we think their premises and all uh, with a very open and balancing uh, attitude, not only towards education itself, but also library and what you can make available for students that are actively enrolled. So we've seen that happening, like all the teachers now in all different levels have become very aware of copyright because everything they did in terms of uh, Live classes is not the same thing as online ones, and they have a lot of questions. But uh, what I've seen is not only lower governments like counties and state-wise regulations, they're all pushing for openness now. So there is an awareness of it that goes independently of the central government. So the central government basically omitted itself from doing anything, and then the institutions are actually carrying that on. So this is what we see in the field. And we are very embarrassed that Brazil has not signed and subscribed to the India uh, and South Africa proposition. It's actually been going around in a not very good terms. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So particularly, particularly for text and data mining research, um, in order to use, and the purpose of using text and data mining research is to have machines kind of uh, find correlations that might not be possible with the human eye, human, human mind, or to digest, you know, millions and millions of articles. People are using that to try to find COVID treatments, et cetera. Um, and in order to make those databases, one needs to be able to make a reproduction of a whole work in order to put it in that database, even for a non-expressive purpose, even if you're not releasing it to the public, right? And not all countries have those exceptions. Brazil is one doesn't have those exceptions. So what's going on at the World Intellectual Property Organization that might bear on this topic? Can you fill us in a little bit? I, I think that, uh, well, I think data and text mining needs to be on the table at, at WIPO. 
which hasn't really yet. And I think it's ready for that now. So far, we were focusing on LUM, which means library, archives, museums, education. And now researching is getting up. And I think in that wave, I think data and text mining must be included. Because once people become aware of what data and text mining is, I think they will be very accepting of what it is. Most people are not aware of that at all, of that need to have that exception in order to do what they are already doing. And I think, well, at least in Brazil, the whole research community, and from what I've been talking in Latin America as well, the research community has become much more aware of that. And in fact, the ones that have been more aware are the health institutions. Like in Brazil, Fiocruz is leading that whole process in fighting COVID and so on. And they are practicing like pretty much and actually approved an open data and open science policy just two weeks ago. Uh, that was on the table for like two years and then that speeded up. So what we've been seeing is that institutions becoming aware and doing so. And I've been talking to a few Congress people uh, and they are now becoming aware. Oh, this is it. Oh, we could have that. Oh, oh, interesting. So it's the first time they actually have heard of it, you know, one way or another. So and they've been accepted so far of that. And I do think the education um, pledge for openness will also uh, make its way through because it now became very clear. And all of the distinction of the inequality of the whole country and how access to the material, to connection and so on, that's uh, a hurdle for the country. So that's becoming aware all over, which wasn't like seven months ago. Yeah. Let me, Marsha, and, and you know, we wanted you to back clean up a little bit on purpose because you yourself are an international trade expert and you know used to do a lot on the policy side, but now counsel businesses. And so you must be seeing more of what of what individual entities, entrepreneurs, et cetera, are really kind of facing on the coal face. Like mm -hmm. how does how does the international field intersect with the with the field of practice right now? Yeah, Sean, thank you. It's really good to be here. Two points in regards to that. Uh, I see that there is a difference between traditional manufacturing. Uh, sector businesses as opposed to those in the high tech space where traditional uh, entrepreneurs were involved in, you know, say for the food industry or the clothing industry so on are concerned, there is an issue with an increase in cyber squatting, uh, which is the bad faith use of the domain names that affects their, their trademarks. And also there's an increase in counterfeit. Now, the issue really is whether or not these entrepreneurs, especially if they're SMEs and they're in developing countries, whether they have the, the budget to actually do the litigation or even to, to employ or have those resources to deal with counterfeit in the market. In terms of the high technology space, I do mostly I do work mostly on the supply chain aspects of blockchain and distributed ledger technology. And I find for businesses that are more so they're, they're not early stage startups, but they're more at the product offering stage. There is still, even in COVID-19 times, an interest in commercializing their IP and managing their IP. But a lot of times, especially if they're not in uh, incubators or getting help from IP clinics in law schools, for example, there is that challenge of, find, or of trying to figure out how, how everything fit, fits well together. And so innovation is still going on in, in the high tech sector, uh, more than even, even in traditional industries. But however, not all innovation is intellectual property. And I find that for early stage startups, there is a problem where there is not sufficient IP knowledge. And even if they know that they need the assistance of an intellectual property lawyer, a lot of times there's an issue of getting a good IP expert at an affordable price. These are some of the issues. In the, in the interest of time, I won't go on too much with that. And I do want to talk a little bit of, about whether or not international law is, you know, is has any relevance to uh, an SME. But Sean, mm. I don't know if that's in a, in a different round or... Nope, do it right now. I think, yeah, okay. I think given the time, we're going to have one big Okay, <laughs> so uh, Rashmi, before spoke about TRIPS, which is the agreement on the trade related intellectual aspects of intellectual property rights. And uh, 
most all countries within the WTO have implemented those minimum standards of protection. And so in most jurisdictions worldwide, you'll find a hybrid of IP laws, meaning you'll have the framework of, of the from the TRIPS uh, legislation, but you also have more robust forms or stronger forms of IP coming through uh, free trade agreements. But how well these work in any economy, uh, whether developed or emerging, it really depends on the IP capacity of the jurisdiction. So whether or not the, the, there is an conducive, a conducive IP ecosystem that will allow the IP right to flourish. So what I find in my work with many developing countries is that for the little person out there, uh, sometimes a, a female-led business or even in the indigenous community, there is either a, a lack of access to the right IP knowledge, uh, not being able to access venture funding or even monetary or fiscal policy, the, the, just the missing links that relate not just to the law, and I'm talking fast in the interest of time, that relate not just to the law, but to everything else. So that is missing. And there are actually projects going on right now, uh, not only in emerging economies, but even here in Canada that are trying to make, make intellectual property more, uh, have, may have, a, have an actual presence within specific sector, including in the, in the, in the health te tech space as well. Uh, hopefully in the breakout room, we can talk about more about these intersections and what will make IP international in terms of the international aspect of it really have that strong relevance in domestic sectors to make it strong intellectual property assets. I'll end there in the interest of time. Yeah, no, thanks for the plug. And I'm, and I'm going to share in the, um, <clears throat> in the chat for everyone, the address to a reception room that we'll be having after this, um, where you can come and, and meet the panelists and ask any other questions, et cetera. This, this session will end. Um, Jasmine, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it goes until 4.30, I believe. So we have uh, you know about, about 10 more minutes. But um, Peter, let me turn it over to you just for summing thoughts. If you, you know, what, what reflections do you have on how COVID may be changing the international system and feel free also to ask any of our panelists some questions if you'd like. You're muted. So in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is to try to uh, help the audience to actually frame the different proposals and uh, projects that have been discussed uh, in this panel. Uh, so I think a very good way to actually tie everything together is to think about how we're going to interact with the TRIPS agreement. Uh, so we have three different buckets of issue. The first one is to maximize the different flexibility that's within the TRIPS agreement. And so uh, within panel, we talk about compulsory licenses. Uh, I, th I think uh, we get into some of the exceptions and Alan also get into the tax data and mining, which is also something that will tie to the uh, three-step test within a TRIPS agreement. I think one uh, issue that has come up uh, during the COVID pandemic that has not been discussed is about Article 73 of the TRIPS agreement. And that's the national security exception. And that is the proposal that's been advanced actively by the South Center about how we can actually take advantage of um, that particular provision in light of the essential security interest. Uh, and so that's the first bucket. The second bucket is about how to uh, reform within the TRIPS agreement. And so I think the moratorium, as well as uh, some of the discussion about the Article 31 based opt-out procedure uh, would be in that category. And the last one is basically about the different things that go beyond the TRIPS agreement or we, what we currently have. So we talk about the co open COVID pledge we talk about the um, uh, CTAP, the technology access pool, as well as COVAX facility. And I think those will be in that category. The second thing I want to share with the group before we go into Q&A, <coughs> excuse me, is um, we know that we have um, a global pandemic and we need a global solution. And yet the national politics is actually pushing governments, whether in the US or other countries in a different direction. And so I think the challenge at both the domestic level at, 
as well as the international level is how can we actually tie the two back together? And I think that is a big issue, not just uh, during the COVID pandemic, but also after that. I think uh, when we face another pandemic, we'll be in the same situation uh, because the way the national politics uh, is going or will be going, will be in the same direction to protect the domestic constituents. But at the same time, for a lot of the global problems we get, whether we're talking about pandemic or whether we're talking about climate change, we actually need a global solution and we cannot just stop within one country. Uh, so I'll stop there because I want to leave enough time for, um, uh, for the audience. So we, we do just have a few more um, minutes that we could take a question if someone would like to ask a question. And I think I'm not actually positive how that works. I think I can, if you well, raise your hand. You a question in chat. You can either put a question in chat or I think we can, yeah, we can turn on your mic. So if you'd like to ask a question, you need to raise your hand in the participants button, which is down at the bottom and click on your name on the right side of your name and you can raise your hand or you could insert a chat. And I am just going to Oh yeah, I did. So I have posted the address to the reception room in the chat. And that's just gonna be a very informal reception room. I see, okay, I have a message. Let's see. How does, so Zenath asks, how does IP related issues, how are IP related issues connected to the pandemic? That would be probably we could all present again. <laughs> um, but I think so. I, I think as um, maybe Peter's response was a little bit talking about the solutions. So what are the problems? I mean, I think some of the problems that we were that we were leading off with at the outset is that intellectual property is intended to both provide and it is intended to provide an incentive for various kinds of knowledge production on the copyright side and um, innovation production uh, through patents. And it does through by providing exclusive rights, uh, allowing uh, the holders of those rights to exclude other people either from making the inventions on the one side or reproduction, reproducing materials on the copyright side. And although that is seen as serving the public overall in times of crisis, it can also pose barriers to the widespread dissemination of technology. So it can cause monopoly problems and monopolies raise prices and lower output. And in a crisis where we're trying to treat the entire world, if you only let a small number of of companies make the products and price those products, then prices will be higher and might not have enough of those products to go on out. And so that's why a lot of the intention now on the, on the patent side is looking at how do you get over patent barriers so more suppliers can come in, make more product, make enough for the whole world, bring the prices down where it can be affordable. Or Alon was talking about copyright. How do you do the maximum amount of research when the only people that can really do that research are those that have access to all the materials behind all the paywalls, which restricts the amount of people that, that, can, that can be doing research. Jamie, you were gonna jump in. Do you wanna to add to that? Well, I wanna say one thing we didn't talk about which related to what you're saying was the, uh, she said, uh, uh, there's a public domain, um, it's not really public, it's almost public domain, but it's a, it's an, a big database of open sourcing gene sequences for influenza. And it played a very important role in COVID. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the rapid development of uh, therapeutics or testing of therapeutics or development of vaccines was related to the fact that people could get by around mid-January uh, sequences of uh, people were contributing, scientists were contributing sequences and uploading, including the, the Chinese uh, to this, uh, the global influenza surveillance and response system, G-I-S-A-I-D. Um, I put in, a, I think uh, I can add in the chat, but there's, it's just gsaid.org is, is where the web page is. So that's an example. Some people have said that had that 
tradition not existed in the influenza area of people sharing the sequences, the response would have been slower in the therapeutics and vaccine side. So I think that's an important thing to look at. The other thing I'd say is that a lot of the early therapeutics were a question of repurposing older drugs, which were facilitated by developing computer models based on access to, to whatever data and academic articles they had to, to look at a combination of the sequences they were seeing, but the science that was basically already been done in other areas to see if they could predict good matches between existing re therapies that could be repurposed. So, you know, things like remdesivir was obviously a repurposed thing, and there was quite a few other drugs. Uh, George mentioned uh, how Kalitra was sort of initially sort of targeted as a repurposed product, but the repurposing of older compounds in a new, when there's a new, uh, when there's a new virus out there uh, can be a really important thing. There's a, there's a couple other questions in the chat. Um, one from Rachel, like what, what's, what's the problem with one country finding a vaccine before another? Um, it's always going to be the case that, that, that someone's going That's, to be first. In fact, one of the arguments for sharing is that you know it, it, there's like about 100 vaccines under development. Nobody knew who was going to be first. And also, nobody knew who was going to be best. At first, people thought, oh, vaccines, it's a binary right. thing. You have one or you don't, you know, like on, on a movie or something like that. But they're talking about vaccines that have efficacy as low as 30%. And so it's not just, does the vaccine work? It's which, what, which vaccines work the best and it may not even be the same for all populations. And so by pooling all the, all the know-how and the technology, then you wouldn't care who was first. You, you'd be rooting for everyone. You wouldn't just be rooting for the home team. You'd be hoping that someone you know, made it through the finish line because whoever was first and whoever was best, that would be available to everyone. Well, maybe, right? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure. I mean, there, there, there's a lot of advanced purchasing going on. Here, right. So, just take Moderna's mRNA uh, uh, vaccine in, in phase three clinical trials right now. The U.S. government, right, has has paid one and a half billion dollars uh, to fund that work, and in exchange, they've got uh, the first hundred million doses and an option for the second hundred million doses. Canada has lined up for twenty million doses. Uh, it's, it's not even approved yet, and I think, so I, I, yeah, I, I think, I think the customers. I think are there already the, the what the big the big customers the buyers are already putting dibs on you know whatever vaccine is well gonna... yeah but you're not you're not drawing a distinction between the products and the know-how and the ip i think you're as i said earlier you're going to have inequality on the products but by restricting access to the know-how and the and, and the ip you're restricting the supply you're making which, which you know, you're having a smaller supply than it would otherwise be the case. What we're doing by hoarding the IP and the know-how and the trade secrecy is, is, is for commercial purposes. The response of the global community to COVID has been to protect the commercial interests of the developers more than the general public. And if they were interested in trying to protect the general public, everything would have been open source at a deep level, including know-how and access to cell lines so that whenever something did work, you weren't stuck with like one company controlling the manufacturing supply, which is, which is one of the reasons why you got people so freaked out about the advanced purchasing contracts. I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, one thing that uh, Frank Tietze at, at Cambridge and, and I and others have been uh, writing about is, you know, <laughs> when, when countries, national uh, age, health agencies within countries fund this research as the U.S. government has, Rather than simply tying up the uh, the output, you know, for uh, for its own citizens, I mean, you could have also put conditions of open access onto the uh, the output, given the well, huge amounts of government funding, and that's just not being done. Well, well, certainly, certainly, it's a scandal in the middle of this pandemic that every funding agreement from every government didn't require sharing of the know-how, the data. Um, access to the cell lines. That was purely done because they were following a very traditional commercial model. And frankly, the Gates Foundation played a big role in this because they had so much deep expertise in vaccines and they were such a big presence and they had such a long list of consultants and they had a bigger infrastructure of sort of brain power around this issue that everyone was like, well, what does Bill think? 
And what Bill thinks is it should be very strong IP. And so if you look at the CEPI model, it's essentially like there is, there is technology transfer in CEPI, but within the cartel. And uh, that's basically something he's comfortable with. And, and uh, the WHO, all these other parties kind of fell in line, even, even presidents of countries, because they didn't really themselves know that much about vaccine markets. But uh, uh, it's a scandal that we went proprietary and this sort of cartel approach on the vaccines when uh, the option obviously should have been the other way. I mean, there was no argument on investment because the governments were de-risking the hell out of everything. I mean, we were paying for people to build factories. And, and I think Moderna got more than a billion now. I think it was closer to two and a half billion. Well, yeah, they got a first billion and now a second one and a half billion. So the, the bell for us is now tolled. So I want to thank everybody. I thought this was a really great panel. Um, we're, we're learning as we go along on how to do uh, you know, good events in Zoom. And I feel like this is one. So thank you for being part of it. And I've just put the link to the reception room uh, in the chat. And so that I think is opening now. So if anybody wants to chat a little further, I saw there was a Another evocative question that said, is the Gates Foundation the good guy or the bad guy? So if you want to discuss that question, we'll be doing it in the reception, reception room now. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sean, for organizing this. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's a pleasure.